Where do old aeroplanes go when the time comes to retire them from the sky? Almost one in ten of them are flown to eCube Solutions in Wales, one of the world's fastest growing facilities for the recycling and stripping out of old aircraft. Whatever the customer wants, we'll take off. Every year, around 60 commercial airliners land at the company's designated airbase, and the lads just can't wait to get their hands on them. All these planes, and you just get to play with the biggest toy set in the world. This squadron of high-vis heroes love to get their hands dirty and fly in the face of whatever problems are thrown at them. Yeah, there's pressure. Um, we cope with it, we thrive on it. They join forces to take these old airliners to pieces so their thousands of mechanical components can be sold on to satisfy the growing global demand for refurbished plane parts. Let's get them off the aircraft. But it's a race against the clock to take these multi-million pound planes to pieces before they reach their final destination, the scrapyard. All these are ready to go now, so we're going to have the demolition boys are going to be coming in and they're going to start smashing them up. Join the lads as they battle hostile weather and get to grips with massive machinery. I've seen them go down smoother, put it that way. All to meet deadlines set by bullish buyers. Money's time, time's money. And we're not talking peanuts here, we're talking millions. Welcome to the world of the plane reclaimers. So, good job, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> Get this one out of the way so we can get this one out. Over on the airbase today, preparations are being made to get to work on the latest arrivals. And it's a sobering reminder of just how precarious the airline business can be. Last year, 14 airlines went bust with combined losses totaling hundreds of millions of dollars. One of those airlines was Small Planet from Lithuania, and eCube have taken delivery of three airbuses from that fleet. It's a little bit of a risky business though, you know. There's a lot of money people put into them to set up an airline. Let's say if it don't if it don't work out, they can lose a lot of money, you know, instant overnight basically, isn't it? You know, we do get uh, quite a few of them coming here, you know, and uh, the more we get in, the better it is. It uh, pays the bills for us at the end of the day, you know. Keeps the missus happy with the money coming in. The engines of this Airbus have found a prospective buyer, but he isn't buying them blind. They could be worth up to $6 million each. The sale is subject to them passing a series of rigorous tests conducted under the direction of a maintenance company sent on site by the buyer. Let's just hope he likes what he sees once the lads have helped to take them off. Khalil's one of the team tasked with assisting with the removal. The best thing about this job is that I'm given the freedom because the management, the supervisors, team leaders know that um, a lot of the time they'll give us a job or they tell us we need to do this and we'll just get on with it. We'll just So they don't really bother us too much saying, oh, um, how much have you done? Or are you done yet? They just give us the job and say, oh, here you go, this is what you need to do. And we just get on with it. Khalil's one of the team tasked with assisting with the removal. Since he arrived at eCube, Khalil has been mentored by Sam. Khalil, what a lad, eh? He, um, he's come here, he's had um, very little experience, done his college and all that, university. He's come here, he's, um, he's one of the best lads we've had come through the doors, you know, with the, with the experience levels. He's so keen and eager to learn, and I mean, you just see from him now the stuff he's doing now, he's, uh, he's well on the ball. Uh, he's a pleasure to work with, dare I say it. <laughs> no, he is, he's a pleasure to work with. He's an honest lad, you know, good hard worker. So, with Sam and Khalil's love in over, it's time to knuckle down and get the engines removed. The buyer is standing by, and there really is not a moment to waste. It's the next day at eCube, and all is not well. 
The Airbus has been towed out of the hangar and is back on the runway. That's because a problem has been identified with the engine. The buyer is concerned that it may not be up to scratch. So I'm acting on behalf of the buyer of an engine, and we inspected the engine as part of the due diligence. And uh, there, are, there are deposits on part of the engine on some of the blades, so we couldn't actually get a, a clear indication of whether the engine was serviceable or not. So we agreed with the current owner that we, we would wash the engine, and that would remove the, uh, the deposits, and then we, we, we'll inspect the engine again. And then, all being well, the engine will pass inspection, and, uh, and then we can close on the deal, purchase the engine, and in two days' time, it will be trucked to uh, Heathrow and shipped down to the Middle East, where it will be installed on an aircraft that's waiting for the engine right now. The, the other issue is, if we don't make the, uh, the delivery schedule on Friday, uh, in, you know, in two days' time, we, it'll be pushed back by another week. Uh, and to have a, an aircraft sat on the ground for a week waiting for an engine is, you know, an expensive situation to be in. If the plane was on the ground for as long as Carl fears, it would cost tens of thousands of dollars in lost earnings. The engine removal has been put into fast reverse. Khalil is now part of the team who has to assist with reconnecting everything so the engine can be given a ground run. He's only too aware what's at stake. Megabucks. The value of the engines can be anywhere between uh, 7 million to about, I don't know, 20, 25 million. Just be careful with it, really. Try not to damage anything. Khalil is really getting his hands oily on this one, and it's a challenge for him. I've never reinstalled an engine, so usually we just take them off. A lot of it was just reverse of what we do anyway. So um, getting it up uh, and aligning it right and everything, that was, that was a bit of a mission. Um, but it was a good learning curve for me. With the engine reconnected, it's now ready to be fired up. Under the supervision of the buyer, it will be given a clean to see if the high-pressure wash can remove the grimy deposits that are a major concern for Carl. If it doesn't come out clean enough and fails, they could be destined to become very expensive pieces of scrap metal. With the buyer guiding the procedure, E-Cube's head of operations, Bob, has been brought in to assist. But, first of all, they have to get the plane started. We'll charge the batteries up and then try and test the APU, make sure she works. Okay, battery's going on. And we've got an electrical page. Bob's looking a bit edgy. A bit trepidation here, because this hasn't run for some time. Hmm. Six million dollars could now rest on the flick of this switch. Because if there's no power to the engine, there's no way of testing it. Temperature increase, RPM increase. This is looking good. But fully confident, we're on a winner. So far, so good. But whilst they've got the plane powered up, there's still no power to the engines, which is obviously right. not a good sign. That on crank, fuel is off. APU airs on. Was Bob's confidence misplaced? Nothing happening. Nothing. Very complex mechanics, um, a lot of electronics, um, fuel feeds, air feeds. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, which um, can go wrong. Khalil joins forces with Bob so they can get to the bottom of this mystery. It's looking more and more likely that this could be a dud engine. Ah, ah, I know what's happening. We need to blank off the other pylon. It's all leaking out of it. Just as it looks like all is lost, Bob has a breakthrough. He spotted that one of the pipes that's pumping air into the engine to power the turbines is leaking. Well, that's saying it's okay now. Harold! And he's right, but communication is a problem on this one, so he has to go and deliver the news in person. Guys, I'm just going to try it again, because I think I've got the air working. So, 
the tubs. And Bob gets a lung full of air for his efforts. Tell me if air comes out of here. By the time he gets back to the cockpit, his woes have grown. The aircraft's computer is still registering a fault. It's really not Bob's or this plane's day. I don't know, it's not working now. You've got to go in then. It was going, but it stopped. It's not now. Hi. What is the engine start valve isn't working? So you've got their start valve not open. No. That's the APU there. There we go. Off. It's indicating open. Bleed air on. It's working now. Weird. Oh, the APU's off now. <laughs> it looks like there are gremlins in the works, determined to make sure this engine gets sent to the scrapper. So when, when did that shut down? <laughs> I'll just start the A I'll just start the APU up. Come on, Bob, you can do it. Start valve fault. Right. And he does. We have power. That's that's the first time that's worked. So A shutting the APU down, restarting it, has done it. When something doesn't work, you obviously want to make it work, and it's a challenge then, so you, you want to overcome that challenge, and it's, it's great then when you fault diagnose things and get them all working. With the engine now running, Bob and the gang give it a short ground run to warm it up. This is the prelude to the cleaning and inspection by Carl. If it doesn't come up clean, he may not be buying it. As any caked on deposits in the finely tuned machinery hugely impede the engine's efficiency and worth. We're going to... Um, ground run it at idle and then carry out a compressor wash. The compressor is washing the actual compressor blades inside the engine with a um, soapy water solution. The ground run is a success, but the real test is still to come. The plan is lunch now and then compressor wash after lunch and see what happens after lunch then. See if we can get it started again. As the boys at the base stress over getting the engine running and sold, one of E-Cube's owners, Tim, is having a day out. Another airline that's gone bust has had an online auction, and Tim, as a former Rolls-Royce executive, is well used to spending the big bucks. About a week ago, uh, someone gave me a call of one of my customers and said, hey, there's, a, there's an auction going on. Do you want to take a look at it? You ought to take a look. And it was about uh, 30 minutes into it, and. Gradually, things started going off the list, so I, I hurried up and got Andrew and uh, Nick involved, and we started looking at different things, and before I know it, we had uh, five truckloads of items, about 50 lots. So, uh, yeah, Mike came by and took my mouse away from me, but uh, it was good fun. So, uh, and now we got to find out what it looks like. There's a couple of mystery boxes in there that might have some nice things in it, but um, we have steps. Uh, there's even a tug. Well, there's two tugs and a crane. So there's the crane. It looks nice on the picture, and a big tug. That should be able to do uh, 747, 767s, we think. And then uh, a smaller tug was really just doing utilization, you know, uh, utility equipment around the, the hangar and uh, the site. So I'm pretty excited about those. From the hundreds of lots on display, Tim bought equipment with a new market value of over $250,000, but for the bargain basement price of just $75,000. Tim's brought the company's head of customer services, Andrew, along with him to inspect and test their new wares. We went down there to collect a load of material that Tim had gone crazy at auction for and decided to buy practically the whole of the facility. This fire sale of aeroplane paraphernalia has been a truly international affair. Now all they have to do is locate the dozens of items that Tim has bought from hundreds laid out in the massive hangar. First up, some safety strops for securing planes in the yard, which Andrew counts up. 32 there. OK, that works. <laughs> <laughs> On to the next one. What is that? It goes to a... It, it, uh, you put it underneath. Tim can barely contain his joy. That's a platform. Which one did we buy? Are those 280? 272. Two, two. Hard to check. You walk in and all you see is tooling, staging, access equipment, vehicles, and all they've got on them is a tag. So you literally got a list of material, all got numbers on them. You have to locate the, those numbers on these tags and then dig all of that stuff out to load your lorries yourself. So it was just daunting. 
really daunting. How's it going? You all right? Yeah. yeah all good. good, yeah. Nice one. Good. And I mean, a lot of this stuff is really, really useful for us back home. And it's not often you get this kind of um, opportunity to buy this kind of stuff at a decent price, because it's normally really expensive kit. So I think that's why he was a bit like a kid in the sweet shop and just went trigger happy with his mouse and bought 50 lots at the auction, but uh, and still trying to buy more, as it seems now. <laughs> He's looking to buy more already, and he hasn't even taken what we bought first time round yet. I don't know if there's two or one. I need to get you out of here. I like this. Honestly, I've got to get you out of here. Tim's really been bitten by this auction bug. My yeah. supermarket sweep, it is, honestly. It'll just take everything. I'll just buy it all. That's at least here where he's getting that thing to move up and down. He went absolutely bonkers with it and bought all of everything, plus then stuff that he expected was going to be worth us buying on top of that. How many of them did you get? Of these? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I got a bit carried away there at one moment. Uh, you don't say. Andrew, there's a box of stuff for you. Tim has even gone for an aeronautical lucky dip. So there was two boxes, metal uh, chests that Tim bought, and it said includes contents. So obviously there's a bit of excitement because it's got something in it, but we don't know what it is. So we go over, we manage to locate them, we open them up, and they're just full of the airline's colour paint. Oh, wow. How exciting. These new vehicles are essential for the base. E-Cube are growing so fast with so many planes being moved around, Sam's trusty little tug can no longer cope on its own. One of the things we're trying to do from a health and safety standpoint is get rid of ladders. So the more safety stands or platforms that we can get, the better off we are. So that was a big thing. But then we got a bit carried away because we started getting lockers and some steel boxes and shelves. And then there was a crane and a couple of tugs. So we thought, oh, those would be nice to have. So hopefully they work. The crane is by far going to be uh, the biggest um, asset to us, though, because every time we do a lift, every time we're taking off larger flight control surfaces off a big aircraft. We're having to hire cranes in and we're taking rudders off. And the expense of that every time will pay for the crane within three months, I would think. I got lucky because I had no idea what I was yeah. doing. No. Tim has bought everything what's known in the trade as sold as seen, with no guarantee that any of it works, which could be a problem, especially when it comes to the vehicles, as they're the most expensive items. All of the vehicles and stuff had all, all had certificates. They were all used daily. Um, some of them heavy usage, which was a, more noticeable on some than others. But, you know, you buy them as a batch and then you just make good out of the bad. Nothing. Nothing, huh? No. no I think it's flat. That'd be a problem. Oh, no. Andrew can't get the engine running. Has Tim shelled out his hard-earned dollars for a seriously dodgy motor? Oh, he's got oh, some... Oh, he's not just a pretty face. Oh. With the tug started, Andrew needs to try and negotiate it through the maze of ladders and stands so he can drive it onto the awaiting transporter lorry for shipment back to the base. That's close. But the guys are getting themselves into a tight spot. Time to make some room. Fortunately, despite a few near misses, Andrew is a skillful driver, and with Tim willing him on from the sidelines, they move clear of all the obstacles. Now it's time to move on to the smaller vehicle on Tim's shopping list. Got power's good. Come on, baby. Woohoo! All that remains now is the showpiece purchase, the hydraulic lifting crane. It's the most expensive piece of kit that Tim's bought, but is it a $20,000 dud? Find out later. Back over at the base, the lads are still concerned about the problems with the Airbus engine. What it is, the compressor on this particular engine, the blades have got mineral deposits on them, 
bit like salt crystals. So what they'll do, they'll fire the water through it to wash this off. At the moment, the compressor clean team are uploading their equipment. It's a big bath type thing that sits underneath the engine and catches all the water that comes out. The seller has sent their agent, Carl, to inspect the engines. He's now standing by as they're put through a series of rigorous tests. So it's going to have an engine wash. So uh, it's actually the first one that I've seen as well, so it's going to be quite interesting. Um, but basically, the engine's going to be washed through, through a number of cycles, and at each cycle, the actual uh, the, the, the effluent, if you like, the, the water that comes out of the engine is measured, uh, and they measure the particles per million. In, in the water, and through different stages of the wash, it's going to be washed several times, and at each stage, we hope it's going to get better. Carl isn't the only one who's never seen an engine being washed. I've never seen it happen before, so it would be nice to see what happens. Crazy, isn't it? I didn't expect the noise. <laughs> There's water flying everywhere. <laughs> the noise is one thing, but so is the heat. The engine can reach temperatures in excess of 900 degrees. People do look at the engine and go, oh, you know, what, what's going on with the engine? There seems to be a load of steam flying out the back of it. It does look rather impressive when you see it, you know, taking place. It's not something you see every day. Well, the engine is perfectly capable of handling that. You know, as when you think about it, you know, they're flying through heavy rain when they're flying. You know, it, they're designed to be able to handle that. When we've done the first wash cycle, uh, we'll take a sample, we'll measure that, and the parts per million reading of that sample will be the dirtiest. And that will tell us how dirty the engine actually is. Uh, and what we can tend to see then is that once we've done the second cycle, you can see that figure half and then half again on the third cycle. Some engines we wash, we have a required reading that we, that we have to hit, a target reading, uh, and that is when we know the engine is really, really clean. The moment of truth is now dawning. Has the engine scrubbed up like new? With poker faces all around, it's impossible to tell. But Carl's look says it all. The engine is still not clean enough. They need to run another test. You could cut the atmosphere with a knife, as all eyes are once again on the steaming turbine. We're going to take a water sample from there now. Uh, to see how clean it is compared to the There's one added bonus to this operation. It cleans the engine, which means it pollutes less. It's nice to know that you're helping the environment, uh, you know, and that you're also um, contributing, you know, towards helping airlines save money on the fuel bin as well. Carl is still not satisfied and has asked that the engine be cleaned once more. Everything now rests on this final test. And whether Carl will open up his checkbook and sign that check for six million dollars. So this one's actually going to go for one minute. Um, it's the last cycle, so this is the one that hopefully gets that engine spotless. results are in and it's good news huge improvement um, you know the engine was really dirty and we're hoping that that's cleared the, the deposits and clean the engine it's now sparkling clean we'll go faster <laughs> but the engine will be removed tomorrow morning and then prepped ready for shipping all the paperwork has to be done uh, and then yeah we should be able to get the engine out of here uh, midday on Friday and uh, into Heathrow and down to down to the Middle East, so it's looking good.
You haven't driven one of these? No. <laughs> Back up north, Tim and Andrew are still shopping at the fire sale of another bankrupt airline. They've already moved and shifted two vehicles that Tim bought out into the loading bay, but they've saved the best till last. But proving there's engine troubles all around today, it's not the best of starts. <laughs> Novice on board. Great. How are you turn the alarm off? The engine's in there. So therefore, battery might? With the alarm disabled, they're hoping the engine hasn't suffered the same fate. They just need to get it started. It would help if they could find the batteries. Hmm. Interesting. Did you look in here? Yeah. We can't find the battery. If we can't find the battery, we can't replace it or charge it, try and jump start it. So I'm just going to Google it and see if a Google can help me. I tried everything, even looked for a manual on my phone online. Nothing. Nothing at all. You get all kinds of weird results come when you search for Jones Iron Fairy 15, which is what his crane is called. As Andrew scours the net for a motor manual, outside, Tim's tugs are getting loaded up onto their transporter beds. Hey, hey. Ta-da. The hunt for the battery is over, but the quest to get it started is only just beginning, and they're running out of time. They haven't moved any of the steps or the storage lockers that they bought onto the waiting lorry yet, and to add to their woes, it looks like the other tug that they bought may not fit onto the trailer. The tug was so low to the floor, we had to build, like, this ramp that went on for miles for him to get a more gradual approach. We just need a bit of height that way. It was just bottoming out all the time. We're just trying to get that height there to stop it from catching and getting stranded. Like Jenga. Jenga. <laughs> Thank God for that. Back at the crane, Tim's brandishing a lasso of jump leads in a bid to get the vehicle started. This is the fun bit with about 40 levers, not knowing which one does what. So I'm going to have some fun in here. Uh, there. Is this? Transmission range, it says there, look. Six forward and three reverse. Everything you're supposed to do, put it in gear, take the handbrake off, put your foot on the throttle and go. But nope, not in this thing. I've got no idea otherwise how the hell to get this thing moving. How hard can it be? What's that thing under there? I'm just going to pull it and see. See what happens. Absolutely nothing. No one could get the thing to move. You try every gear, revving it hard, take to make sure all the brakes obviously off. Nothing. Nothing, nothing. With all of Andrew's efforts falling short, they're also running out of time as the crane needs to be loaded onto the flatbed or the lorry will leave without it, meaning they will run up even bigger transportation costs. But a night of the road has come to the rescue and started the crane just in the nick of time. Someone came down from the office upstairs and went, oh, yeah, I'll move it for you now, jumped in, and it just moved. And he did nothing any differently to anyone else, which was really frustrating. <laughs> Where's the magic button, then? <laughs> But, yeah, that was, um, testing. <laughs> they're going to try and get it off the other end. That's going to be the fun bit, because I haven't got anyone who knows what they're doing. I'm not going to tell them. They can have the same issues I had when I tried it earlier. Hey, you got it working. Thank you very much. Whilst Andrew has been wrapped up with getting the crane working, Tim has carried on shopping. It might look like a lot of gear, but their company has doubled in capacity in the last year alone. Next year, as many as 100 planes could be landing at their facility, waiting to be reclaimed. Tim decided, while we're here, to buy another 20 lots of this stuff. So all the steps you can see, he's bought them. Anything aluminium, aluminium, whatever you want to call it, he's bought them. So that means booking more trucks now for tomorrow an extended stay for another day, just to get the rest of the stuff that he bought. I should have never left him alone. I should never have left him alone. All the extra gear means the lads can now get a real conveyor belt of dismantling going. 
with them expected to increase capacity by almost a third, which means around 20 extra commercial airliners a year, just to keep up with the growing demand for their services. We're now running five lines at uh, back in St. Athens. Last year we were running two, three, so the more access equipment we can have, the safer it'll be, and the, the more efficient we can become on working on the aircraft. My legs are too long for in here. <laughs> Look where the brake is. Those are levers. Do you want to tell me what they do? Yeah, they make the fork leg move. Definitely need a beer tonight after this. And he's still wandering around looking to buy more stuff, so I'm going to try and catch hold of him, rein him in so that he doesn't uh, make more work and then we end up staying another day or end up here till midnight tonight knowing him. It's been a jam-packed day and the loaded lorries now begin their long journey back to Wales, where they will surely be put to good use straight away. of destruction is drawing closer for the fleet of planes from bankrupt airline Small Planet. And Scrapyard Chief Chicken has the scrapping plan in place for the planes. The most challenging uh, has to be uh, time management. Um, because I've got quite a few aircraft with a reasonably small team, uh, we don't always get the answers uh, to what needs to be done straight away or when, when we would want them. So uh, it's hard to manage what needs to be done when it does and then sometimes we get answers through and they've got to be rushed through as a high priority. But at the last minute, a request comes through for a part of the plane that is normally just destined to become rubbish. I was prepped up to remove the doors and the flight deck as part of my cuts, uh, but now they've required the the full trim, including the toilet uh, units, the galleys, uh, the overhead bins, ceilings, sidewalls, the dado panels. We've got approximately three weeks until the demolition team uh, come in and clear the yard for us, and there's still an awful lot left for us to do. Um, so at the moment, it's quite hard to manage what I need to cut, what I've got the go-ahead to cut, um, and how to manage it with the manpower. So um, it's pretty tough at the moment, but we're working through it with the uh, possibility of extra work on the weekends, um, and hopefully we'll get everything done. The extra work puts strain on the schedule, but Chicken runs a tight ship, and his team all pull their weight. So at the moment, they've, uh, the seats have been completely removed and have been put into storage. The next steps now are the sidewalls and the dado panels to be removed. And then it's the overhead bins, which um, I've got a lot, a lot of work involved in removing the bins. And then it's pretty simple then to remove the uh, toilet units and the galleys. The interiors are going to be used to refurbish a plane on another airline. And Roger is on hand to start getting the panels out. But a commercial airliner is quite a departure for Roger, who used to be air crew for the US Air Force. The B-52, eight engines, massive aircraft. Uh, too many of anything, too many pumps and valves and all that, so it's a big aircraft. Jumping from there to commercial, it's a big step uh, in reduction of equipment and parts. Uh, it's much, most of the interior of these, these aircraft is plastic, composite, while the military side is nothing like it. It's all insulation. It, it's not, it doesn't call for extra weight to be in there. This airplane has over 100 oxygen masks with canisters, all needing to be removed. And Roger knows firsthand that these need to be handled with care. This unit is activated upon an emergency to, uh, to them. And as you can see on this one, this one has four masks and one uh, canister. Once the chemicals initiated, they will pop out automatically from the, uh, as the pilot initiates uh, the system, which activates a chemical reaction inside this canister. Now this canister gets extremely hot, so hot that it'll burn the carpet. I've come across in the past, someone had spilt it on the floor without realizing what they were doing. The fluid ran down to a heat source and it caught fire. Uh, and some of the seats had gone up and the insulation went off. They destroyed three air, well, three military aircraft, two 
four commercial aircraft and any, almost any equipment that was in there, it, everything went up in flames. That was right there. I, was, I, see, I seen it all. There are over 60 windows that need to be removed. They're amongst the lowest value items on the plane, but are highly sought after by aviation salvage yards who sell them to ingenious designers. It'll take about, uh, two, minutes, about two minutes per window reveal for writing the, this plastic that's in bind, and then the screws come off. And as soon as I got my colleagues back there taking off the dado panels on the bottom, and once that's done, they just put, go straight up and off they come. And then each of these panels should be or will be marked as the position numbers, left hand or right hand. And any relevant screws that usually go with it will be bagged and set with each, each of the units. On hand to help is a relative newcomer to plane stripping, Marcus. He's only been in the trade 10 weeks. He's loving getting to see all the hidden parts. It's closer to DIY than it is aircraft engineering to me, because I haven't, I haven't never really worked with bits of plastic and stuff like that, so it, it is relatively straightforward, but you're also dealing with very fragile bits, and you're also dealing with uh, brittle stuff, so... I, I take my time a little bit more, make sure that I'm not forcing anything and snapping anything. But uh, yeah, it is nice. It's nice to be able to just see the process coming off one big lump, next big lump, next big lump. It's interesting because you get to see all the like sort of nooks and crannies. You get to see what's behind everything. You know, I'm coming across panels that got electric blocks behind them and stuff like that. And you're working out how things work around the aircraft. And that. it's uh, it's interesting. It's very. Uh, well, I think it's the sort of experience you can't really get with a with a textbook. You know, it's uh, when you're actually seeing it physically coming off and seeing how everything works and stuff like that. Like, you know, I never would have had a situation where I could see all the emergency stuff, all the emergency procedures, the medical kits, and all this and that. It's all it's it's very interesting. You know, it's a different sort of experience uh, getting in amongst everything. <laughs> With the team working flat out, it takes a day to get the window panels out, leaving nothing more than the fuselage. The normal person who obviously doesn't work on uh, on aircraft won't won't see the, the almost the skeleton of the aircraft is what what, what is left. Um, they are strong aircraft. I mean, um, don't let this sort of like tear you off from from flying. But um, once we take out what we want the structure, there's not a huge amount of it left. Which means the remainder of the aircraft is edging ever closer to its final scrapping. Until today, if the lads wanted to move a plane around, they were mostly dependent on Sam and his trusty little tug. But that's all about to change with the arrival of a whole new fleet of on-site transporters. Tim and Andrew's shopping bill has set them back a whopping $75,000. So these new bits of kit will need to earn their keep as soon as possible. Obviously, start the back and work our way forward. It looks like all these new toys are going to be a welcome help. Sam, in particular, looks well pleased with the new arrivals. He's brought a whole load of kit here, uh, which is good. Uh, it's going to help us so much. You know, with all the new um, staging steps and equipment he's bought, and uh, it, it, just, it, does, it shows that we're uh, we're progressing. We're getting bigger and bigger. I think that's one step beyond. We've got so many aircraft here now, we need all this gear. If we're going to be running five teardowns at a time, we're going to need all this gear. So uh, at least we've got it now, rather than uh, sort of fighting each other who needs what and when, and I, you know, so we can just get on with it. We've got, uh, we got another truck at the gate coming in now. Our new aircraft tugs have just turned up that uh, Tim's bought. So I just come off to uh, offload them, have a look at them and hopefully we'll get to use them in the next day or two. Fine. Look at that beauty, eh? Huh? Look at that. That's all right, isn't it? This one will be predominantly for the larger aircraft, the, uh, the large Airbuses and the large Boeings. That's some movement. 
There we go. Let's see how he goes now. All eyes are now on the offloading. It was touch and go that it would get on the lorry. Now it looks like it's touch and go, it'll come off. Because it's going to save us so much hassle now, because we have to borrow a big tug to move the large aircraft. So at least we've got our own now. We can just get on and do what we want when we want. We haven't got to rely on other people and work around them, which uh, we're going to save us so much hassle it is. And it's got four-wheel steering, which is quite good, so that makes it more manoeuvrable. The one we use for the big stuff now has only got two-wheel steering. So it's, uh, we're quite limited on how, how tight and how sharp and turn stuff and that. Peter did absolutely brilliantly, didn't they? <laughs> I'd still be up there by lunchtime, I think, really. Me. The tiny tug doesn't want to leave the trailer, so it gets unceremoniously shoved off. Stick in gear! <laughs> As for Sam, he can't wait to get behind the wheel of the new crane. Sam's been working on aircraft for over 20 years. He's keen to put the vehicle, which he's never driven before, through its paces. He set himself the challenge of driving it into its parking spot. I'm quite impressed with it. It's uh, quite manoeuvrable. It's very manoeuvrable because it's got four steering. Yeah, it seems a bit weird because it's so low down, but uh, it's just stuff we'll get used to. You know, the more we use it, uh, the more we'll get used to it. He brings her in, cruising to a stop as smooth as you like. Make it, home, make it homely inside, eh? <laughs> Get some fair dice in there. <laughs> we'll see. But yeah, it's good. It's great that we've got his kit. Tim's spending spree has been a triumph, with lots of new kit raring to go and ready to be put to work on the yard. It's a sad day when an airline goes bust, but it becomes E-Cube's gain when the planes get sent to them for reclaiming and scrapping. They have three planes on the lot to be demolished today. For Perry, this is the best part of the job. I love all this, see, I love it all. And uh, while they're crushing it, uh, the machinery is amazing. I'd love to do that job as well. Piece by piece, one by one, the entire fleet is destroyed by the monster mashers. There it is, there's a nose gone. Cockpit's gone. That's just skin, that is, there's nothing inside it. Now, where the wing is, that's the beefy part of it. That's where all the spar is, the tanks, that's all the fuel tanks. And he's, uh, he's having a crack now on the, on the strong bit. It's surprising how strong as well a plane is. It's only three mil. But it is nice watching them being crushed up, though. And today, Perry isn't just watching the final death throes of these planes. It's also the end of an entire airline. Surely even hardened plane wrecker Perry must be a bit moved by what's unfolding. When you think about it, all the hours these planes have flown, and it comes down to this, a big scrap of metal on the floor. It's sad to see a plane ending up like this. Yeah, I can see it from the plane's point of view. But from my personal point of view, nah. So the other week, we took the doors off it, and now it's gone. I say, on a small planet, it's just been disintegrated. Yeah, gone. All gone. And that's the end of those aeroplanes. Time to make room for the next lot.